talk about the means. We talked about p tests and garden variety f tests last week. And one of the things that I had suggested was that when uh, Sean dropped his keys, he went over and he looked around underneath the street lamp because the light was better there. And so this was by way of introducing the notion that sometimes we're interested in uh, using an estimator which is restricted, there's a constraint on it, because although that introduces, can introduce some bias, it reduces the variance of our estimator. And there's a trade-off between the bias and the reduced variance. And so if that trade-off exists, maybe the kinds of f-tests that we usually state are too stringent. So, for example, in the bread and meat example that we just had, we had said that beta m was equal to beta b was equal to uh, gamma was equal to zero against the alternate that at least one is not zero. Under the null hypothesis, the restriction has to be exactly true. Not almost true, it has to be exactly true. Well, if it's the case that we're willing to accept a little bit of untruth, we certainly got a lot of that in the last, whatever it was, two and a half years of presidential campaign. If we're willing to accept a little bit of untruth, then the way we write our null hypothesis is too stringent. Maybe we ought to come up with a different way of stating the null hypothesis. And the different way of doing it is to consider mean squared error instead of squared error loss. Mean squared, where we can make a position. So instead of making the restriction exactly binding, let's say we're willing to relax them a little bit. We're not, our null hypothesis is not so, so sharp and so pointy that if the, uh, we want to allow them to be perhaps a little different from zero and still not reject the null. So the way we're going to do that is by looking at the mean square error. And I think we I introduced mean square error last week. I said the mean square error was equal to the variance plus the square of the bias. And I think I even had written some things on the board to show where that came from. And so if we let beta hat be our garden variety unrestricted least squared estimator, its mean square error is the same as its uh, own covariance matrix. So sigma square times x transpose omega inverse x close paren inverse. That's a k by k matrix of variance covariance terms. And the mean square error for the restricted least squares estimator, we had both the variance. Oh, and the notation that I'm using is that big S is the thing in parentheses up there. And I did that to economize on notation a little bit. So S is equal to X prime omega inverse S. That's S. So they're not quite the same thing as all the way over and over again. So the variance of the restricted estimator, lowercase b, is equal to the least squares variance minus a symmetric positive definite matrix. So the variance of the restricted estimator has to be smaller, or no larger than, the covariance matrix of the least squares unrestricted estimator. And the bias, we can show, is a weighted average of all the mistakes that we make. Little r is a vector. Big R was j by k, and beta was k by 1. So the bias of our restricted estimator, and the derivation is in your book, it's also in your the online lecture notes. Uh, so the bias is a weighted average of all the little mistakes that we made when we impose the restriction. So that the mean square error of the restricted estimator, so the mean square error of the restricted least squares estimator is its variance plus the square of the bias. And we want to choose that estimator with the smaller mean square error. So we'll take the difference between, oh, and the two matrices are of the same dimension. Mean square error of beta hat is k by k, and mean square error of little b is also k by k. So we're going to look at their difference, and so we're interested in, watch the line wrap, we're interested in, uh, after a little bit of algebra, sigma squared times s inverse r transpose, r s inverse r transpose inverse times this other thing. So our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean square error, this k by k positive definite matrix, which is symmetric, minus mean square error little b is zero. That's the null hypothesis. Notice that that's quite different from what had been done heretofore. 
Here before, our null hypothesis was that our restrictions are exactly true. Over here, I'm saying, I don't care if the restrictions are violated a little bit, because in exchange for taking a little bit of bias, I can reduce the variance of my estimator. Now it's time for some tricks, because how are we going to test a hypothesis that involves the comparison of two k by k matrices, given that in principle, every entry in the matrix is a random variance? So we have k to hat and a little b in there. That's pretty awkward. But you can Are we going to construct k times uh, k minus 1 over 2 test statistics? Or is there some kind of single value test statistic that's going to look at all k times k minus 1 over 2? Random variable? Well, no, it turns out that there's a little there's a tricky way to do it. So the alternate hypothesis is that least square is better. The null hypothesis is that We're still rejecting the restrictions if they're not correct, but we're just not being as stringent about it. What's the test <coughs> That's what I'm getting to. Be patient. Uh, let's look at this piece. This is the difference between the two mean square errors. Cover up the sigma square, that's just a scalar. Doesn't matter. It's just a number. We don't know it anyway, so what do we care? So just cover it up. And then we have a piece in square brackets. Look at the part that post multiplies it and the part that pre-multiplies it. It's in the nature of a quadratic form. We're used to thinking about quadratic form being of the sort x transpose a x, where x transpose is a row vector and x is a column vector. And we refer to a as the quadratic form. Well, why can't we do something like b transpose a b and argue that that's a quadratic form? Since a is positive definite and symmetric, and b is a real symmetric matrix. So given that we're pre-multiplying by the transpose of the same thing that we're post-multiplying by, and they are both real symmetric matrices and positive definite, they are immaterial. They don't matter in our determination of which is bigger, MSE of beta hat or MSE of little b. So we'll just take them and we'll rub them away. And we'll look at the part, the quadratic form, in square brackets. That's the only part that really matters. And we're asking the question of whether or not that is positive definite or negative definite. So when we're considering the quadratic form, this whole thing, we could ask, is that quadratic form negative definite or positive definite? But since we already know that B transpose and B are positive definite, the definiteness of A doesn't depend on the Bs. So we can just rub them away and think about the part in the square brackets. In square brackets, I have a piece that's positive definite. And I'm subtracting off another piece that is also positive definite. So what's going to matter is whether or not which one of those two pieces is bigger than the other. It's going to determine this, the definiteness of the, this difference of mean square errors. So that said, at the top of the screen, we can construct any quadratic form, and we can ask the question, is L transpose times the thing in square brackets post multiplied by L, where L is a vector, an arbitrary vector of our choice. Is that greater than or equal to zero for any L? Not identical to zero. We don't ever want to worry about the trivial solution. So we want to know whether or not the thing in square brackets is positive definite. Because that's going to tell us which is, which is the better estimated. If it's positive definite, it means that the mean square error for least squares is bigger than the mean square error for a restricted least square estimated. If it's negative definite, it means that OLS was better because the restricted least square error, uh, mean square error was too big. So we could factor some things out here. We could multiply through on the left by L transpose and multiply through on the right by L and still examine the same inequality. And then with a little bit more algebra, subtract this from both sides and then multiply.